we've got a few uh, major definitions today, but one of them is kind of um, not really a new definition. It's just the observation that a lot of stuff we did with vectors in Rn can generalize to arbitrary vector spaces. So like in Rn, we had the following definition that vectors v sub 1, v sub 2, up to v sub m are called dependent or linearly dependent if this homogeneous vector equation has non trivial solutions. Well, you see, when you look at this definition, we never really use the fact that the vectors are vectors in Rn. For this definition to make sense, we need addition, we need scalar multiplication, and we need a zero vector. And that's all we need. And we have all three of those in any vector space. So we can erase that Rn and replace it with an arbitrary vector space V. And we still have this definition of linear dependence. Let's see. So it's significantly harder in general to determine whether vectors are dependent or independent in an arbitrary vector space. We don't have a one-size-fits-all method of doing that like we do in Rn. Because in Rn, you're just solving a, an equation using Gauss-Jordan elimination. We can do that. If instead we're looking at, say, C0, the vector space of continuous functions, and we have, say, the sine of x, the cosine of x, the sine of x times the cosine of x, the sine squared of x, the cosine squared of x, and the tangent of x. If you asked me if this set was dependent, I would not know what to say, and I wouldn't have any real method for determining if the set is dependent. I mean, I would be reduced to sort of 
going through trigonometry textbooks, looking up trig identities to try to see if there's an identity that would make one of these a linear combination of the other. It's certainly not obvious, and you can't just answer the question by performing Gauss-Jordan elimination. Fortunately, there are sometimes tricks we can do to reduce these problems to Gauss-Jordan elimination problems. Um, not this specifically, but for example, we'll be able by the end of this course to determine if polynomials are linear the dependent. Those tricks will wait for the future. For now, we just want to sort of state the issue, state the definition, and then state a theorem or two, or I guess only uh, one theorem. And this this theorem was a theorem in Rn. It continues to be a theorem in arbitrary vector spaces that a set of vectors is dependent if and only if at least one vector in the set is a linear combination of the others. And if you're following along in the textbook, I mean, certainly I hope my online students are, um, the textbook states this theorem in a way that makes it sound more powerful, but is really the same thing. What the textbook says is, suppose you have a set of vectors, v1, v2, v3, up to vn. The textbook says that this set is dependent if and only if at least one vector is a linear combination of earlier vectors. So V2 is a linear combination of V1, or V3 is a linear combination of V1 and V2, or V4 is a linear combination of V1, V2, and V3, and so on. Um, that sounds like a stronger theorem, but it's really not because sets aren't ordered. That is to say, you can take a set and you can rearrange all of the elements of the set at will. So 
Having a theorem that assumes that the members of a set are in a certain order is actually kind of troublesome. What you can do, I mean, at least one vector in the set is a linear combination of the other. Say you have V1, V2, V3, V4, and this vector V3 is a linear combination of the others. Well, since sets aren't ordered, you could just write these vectors in a different order, and now we have the what well, the next frame guaranteed. I mean, we have that specifically one vector in this set is a linear combination of the previous vectors in the set. So the, this and this really amount to the same thing. And now a Really major definition. Um, basis. And I am going to present this definition exactly as it appears in the textbook, but then I am going to make some comments on the way the textbook presents this definition, because it's slightly weird. Say that H is a subspace of And say that we have some set B, let's call this B1, B2, up to Bn of vectors in right, there we go, of vectors in V. Then B is called a basis of H. If Two conditions are satisfied. First, B, this set of vectors, has to span H. In other words, every vector in H is a linear combination of vectors of B, and every linear combination of vectors in, of B is in H. So, H is the set of all vectors of the form C1, B1, plus C2, B2, up to Cn, Bn. And we need more than that. This set of vectors B has to be linearly independent. Say 
So, a crucial definition, one we'll use constantly throughout the course. But the way that textbook presents it, which is what I have up on the whiteboard here, is a little odd. So let me make a few comments. According to the textbook, every vector in this set B has to be in V. Well, we can state something stronger than that. From the fact that um, H is the span of these vectors, not only do these vectors have to be in V, these vectors specifically have to be in H. And that sort of raises the question, what that vector space V is doing in this definition? And the answer is that it's not really doing anything. We don't need H to be a subspace of some bigger space V. All we need is for H to be a vector space. And the textbook is not doing any actual harm by having that condition in it. And the reason that the textbook is not doing any actual harm is that every vector space is a subspace of itself. So you can have that space V, and you can say, okay, H is a subspace of H, and then just use the definition as it appears in the textbook. But it's a kind of weird thing to do, and it's not necessary. I'm not sure what Lay, David Lay, the author. I'm not sure what his motivation was for, um, for putting that into the definition. So, that's a basis, and bases are important. Um, informally speaking, a basis describes a vector space in the most efficient way possible. A basis describes a vector space in the sense that it spans the vector space. It does it in the most efficient way possible in the sense that it's linearly independent. There are no redundant vectors there. Having stated this definition, let's give a few examples. So example one. Let's go back to Rn, and let's let A be any invertible n by n matrix. Then, the columns 
of A are a basis of Rn. And this comes immediately from the invertible matrix theorem. The invertible matrix theorem says that the columns are linearly independent, and it says that the columns span Rn, and we now know that those two conditions together are the definition of a basis. More specifically, using a particular special invertible matrix, the identity matrix I. So remember what this is. It's the matrix that has ones down the diagonal and is zero everywhere else. I is invertible. In fact, it's its own inverse. So the columns of I are a basis. In fact, the columns of I are what is called the standard basis. If you remember these vectors E1, E2, up to E sub n that showed up when we were discussing matrices of linear transformations, these vectors are a basis of Rn, and they're specifically the basis you get from taking this statement and applying it to the identity. A, let's look. at a different vector space for variety. Let's remind ourselves that P sub n are the polynomials of degree less than or equal to n. And it's hopefully pretty evident that if you have the vectors 1, x, x squared, x cubed, up to x sub n, this set of polynomials is a basis of P sub n. They certainly span P sub n. I mean, they span P sub n basically by the definition of P sub n, right? What is a polynomial? Well, it's a constant times one plus another constant times x plus u. Let's make that e sub 0 and e sub 1 plus another constant times x squared and so on. So So basically, by definition, um, these 
polynomials span P sub n, P sub n is defined to be their linear combinations. The fact that they're linear, the independent is also pretty, pretty evident, because suppose you take one of these linear combinations and you set it equal to zero. Let's be very clear what we're doing here, because this notation can be pretty, pretty confusing. I mean, this is making this look like a calculus problem. We're taking a polynomial, we're set it e setting it equal to zero, and we're solving it. But what we have on the right here is the zero polynomial. So we have a polynomial on the left, we have a polynomial on the right. This polynomial on the right has infinitely many roots. This polynomial on the left has at most n roots, unless a sub 1 and a sub 0 and all of these coefficients are zero. That's the only possible way a polynomial of this form could have more than n roots. So for this equality to hold, these coefficients must all be zero, and this is the trivial linear combination. This, um, this indicates that these vectors here are linearly independent. Questions about this definition? Then let me state a theorem. The spanning set theorem. I might, if I were writing the textbook, have broken this theorem into two, but we'll follow the author. The spanning set theorem, as stated in the textbook, has two parts. The par first part, suppose we have a set of dependent vectors. Dependent vectors, so in particular, can't be a basis of anything. Let's just call this W equals V sub 1, V sub 2, up to V sub N. If this set is dependent, at least one vector in the set 
is a linear combination of the other vectors in the set. We stated that somewhere. We stated it here. That uh, V sub K we'll call it be a linear combination of the other vectors. Then, getting rid of V sub K does not change the span of the set. Let's try to clarify this statement. You have a bunch of vectors. Let's say we have v1, v2, v3, v4, and v5. And we are interested in looking at the span of this set. Suppose that this set is linearly dependent, so that at least one of these vectors is a linear combination of the others. Let's, let's say that V4 is a linear combination of the other vectors, then we can just take V4 and we can kick it out of this set. And kicking it out of the set doesn't change the span of the set. So V1, V2, V3, V4, V5 versus V1, V2, V3, V5, the sets span the same vector space. The textbook states this as the first part of the spanning set theorem, I call it more of a lemma, the really important um, part of the spanning set theorem is as follows. Suppose you have a vector space V, and you have a set B, and this set B is not a basis, but this set B does span V. So this set B satisfies one of the conditions of being a basis, but not the other. In particular, this set B span, um, satisfies the first condition of being a basis, 
but it's not linearly independent, so it isn't a basis. Then B can be turned into a basis by deleting appropriate vectors. That word appropriate is doing some heavy lifting, but I'm basically just talking about what we did in the previous frame. So say we have this set B and it contains these vectors. And B is not a basis. B spans H, but it's not a basis of H. Well, if B spans H, the only reason that B would not be a basis is that B is linearly dependent. If it's linearly dependent, at least one vector in B is a linear combination of the others. We know now that if we take that vector and kick it out, we'll still span a that was the first part of this theorem. So now we have this new set that spans H. And either this is a basis or it isn't. If it isn't a basis, it's because it's not independent. If it's not independent, then at least one vector in the space is a linear combination of the others. Take that vector, kick it out. We still span H because kicking these linear combinations out doesn't change our span. Now we have three vectors. This is either a basis or it isn't. And we just keep going. If this isn't a basis, then some vector in it is a linear combination of the others. We kick it out and we just keep kicking vectors out and eventually we'll get down to a basis. So every spanning set can be turned into a basis. Um, let me, we'll come back to the statement I'm about to make in the next section, but let me just state it now because it's very relevant to what we just did. If a vector space has a finite sp 
expanding set. Then it has a finite basis. Because if it has a spanning set, you can turn it into a basis just by kicking vectors out. And if it was finite to begin with, then certainly kicking vectors out isn't going to turn it infinite. So notice that word if underlined for emphasis. Some vector spaces don't have finite spanning sets, and they don't have finite bases. And um, I can actually give a really sort of simple example of that. We'll talk about this a little more on Thursday, but the vector space of infinite sequences. So the vector space that looks like this with addition defined component twice and scalar multiplication also defined component-wise. This is a vector space. It's a simplest basis. I mean, this is sort of the infinite dimensional version of those E sub i's we looked at. But this vector space has an infinite basis and no finite bases. So not every vector space has a finite base. In linear algebra, we are going to be looking almost exclusively at vector spaces that do have finite bases. And it's going to turn out that as long as a vector space has a finite basis, we can investigate it using matrices and Gauss-Jordan elimination and sort of a bunch of the tools we're used to using. But um, this vector space doesn't. It's an inf interesting question. I mean, this vector space does have a basis. It's just an infinite basis. It's a sort of interesting question of whether every vector space has a basis, period. But we'll touch on that Thursday. For now, let me look at two, let me get this calculator loading so it will be there when we want it. Let's look at two examples of finding a basis. Last week, we defined two special types of vector spaces. We defined null spaces, and we defined column spaces. And if we have a matrix A, it's, we can talk about the null space and the column space, and we can ask about a basis of the null space and the column space. And finding these bases 
is um, as with so much in this class, is going to come down to hitting a matrix with Gauss-Jordan elimination. Because we know how to find no spaces already using Gauss-Jordan elimination. And the method we have for finding no spaces will also give us the basis of the no space. And I mean, the calculator is loaded, but let's Let's just pick a super simple matrix A, and let's investigate this by hand. To find the no space, we need to solve AX equals zero. And to solve AX equals zero, we perform Gauss-Jordan elimination on this augmented matrix. I selected this to keep things simple. It's already in row echelon form. It's very close to being in Gauss-Jordan, um, very close to being in reduced row echelon form. We'll just take the second row and we'll multiply it by negative two and we'll add it to the first row. One, zero, let's see, negative 12 plus Three, negative nine, zero, zero, one, six, zero. Don't know why I was hesitating. This is exactly what I was expecting we find that there are infinitely uh, many vectors that satisfy this equation. x1 equals 9, x3, x2 equals negative 6, x3, rewriting that, x equals x3, times the vector 9, negative 6. And this vector, 9, negative 6, is the basis of the null space. And this is one reason, I mean, one reason among many that I wanted you to be able to write these solutions in parametric form, because the vectors that appear in parametric form are the basis of the null space. If we Let's keep this simple, but but let's make our matrix a little bigger. If this were B, 
and we were asked for the no space, we would once again augment with the zero vector and perform Gauss-Jordan elimination. Once again, I've gone out of the way to make it so that I don't need a calculator. We'll multiply that second row by negative two and add it to the first row. We get one, zero, negative nine, zero, zero, and zero, one, six, two, zero. This time we're going to get multiple vectors. So x1 will equal 9x3 plus 0x4. Oh, I completely botched this, didn't I? I forgot that we have to buffer in our free variables so that we are going to have nine, negative six, one as the basis. So x2 is negative six, x3 minus 2x4, x3 is 1x3 plus 0x4, x4 is 0x3 plus 1 x4. And now our basis is going to have two vectors in it. And once again, those are just the vectors that appear when you write your answer in parametric form. So, once you find the null space, you'll also have a basis of the null space. It's very nice in that regard. Not so the column space. So say A is, let's Just make something up, but again, I don't really want to go to the calculator, so let's make a something that's almost in row echelon, reduced row echelon form already. Um, say we want to look at the column space of A. Now, sort of good news, bad news, we already have a spanning set. That's the good news. The column space of A is spanned by the columns of A, by definition. Bad news, there's no particular reason to assume that the columns of A are linearly dependent. So there's no particular reason to assume that, um, that this is a 
basis of the column space. But we have a finite spanning set, so a finite basis exists. We just need to know how to find it. And we have a nice little theorem, the pivot columns of A are a basis of the column space. So here I made a so simple that you don't have to do any work. This is already in row echelon form. We can read off the pivot positions, although I think one of you maybe ran into a little trouble with that in the test. Remember that the pivot positions are the first non-zero entries once the matrix has been put into row echelon form. So this is the first non-zero entry in the first row. This is the first non-zero entry in the second row. Third column doesn't have any pivot positions in it. And now that we can see the pivot positions, we see that to be a basis, we want to take the first two columns, but not take the third. So those two columns are a basis of the column space. You want to be a little careful with this theorem because to find the pivot positions, you are ordinarily going to need Gaussian elimination. But Gaussian elimination changes the column space. So what I mean by that, let's but something slightly less trivial. One, two, three. One, four, one. Let's let this be a B. And let's ask for the column space of B. To find the column space of B, we need to find the pivot positions. To find the pivot positions, we need to put this matrix into row echelon form. So we perform a row operation. And we put this matrix in row echelon form. We multiply the first row by negative one and we add it to the second row. And now that it's in row echelon form, we can read off the pivot positions. The first column and the second column are the pivot positions. But it would be a mistake to say that the first column and the second column of the reduced matrix are the vectors that we're looking for. 
we're only performing this row operation to find the pivot columns. And once we know what the pivot columns are, we go back to the original matrix and take those columns. So, one, one, and two, four. That should be it for this section. Homework is due uh, Sund Sunday as usual, and I'll see you Thursday.